the word is in verse 8 the word increasing let's read verses 5 through 11 now for this very reason It appears the reason is what he said in verse 4, that you may become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. For this very reason, apply all diligence in your faith. Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control and your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance godliness and in your godliness brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness Christian love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Interestingly, this word supply is the same word as we have up here in verse 5. Supplying, or rather, in your faith supply. You supply, and then God supplies. Peter says down here in verse 14 that he knows the laying aside of his earthly dwelling is imminent. Uh, Peter, you're about done for. Is that what you're telling us? Right. So can you give us some last words? Yes. He says, I'm telling you, verse 8, if these qualities are yours and increasing, they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful. He says here in verse 15 that the time of his departure is near. Well, Peter, before you depart to the eternal shore, what do you want to tell us? I'm telling you, these qualities better be yours and increasing. Now, Peter, you've had an outstanding ministry, a phenomenal ministry. You were with the Lord on the mount, and you saw the Lord in glory, the Mount of Transfiguration. Would you, would you tell us about that? What I want to tell you, he says, is that if these qualities are yours and increasing, you won't be barren or useless. And Peter, you saw some powerful things in your ministry. I mean, you walked on water. <laughs> you saw fish and a remarkable catch of fish. You saw a fish collect your tax money for you. Will you tell us about some of these things? And he says, I, what I want to tell you is these qualities better be yours and increasing. <coughs> now, Peter, you saw, the, you saw the power of God at Pentecost and Thousands were converted. You have the power of God on you in such a way that if just your shadow would cast on somebody, they'd be healed. You saw an angel come and get you out of jail. Would you tell us about those things? What I want to tell you is that if you, these qualities are yours and increasing, you won't be barren or useless. I could entitle this sermon... 
with these two words in verse 8, if increasing. If increasing. We sang that song before the meal tonight, More Love to Thee, O Christ. A lot of our songs are that way. Lord, uh, plant my feet on higher ground. More love to thee, O Christ. Oh, to be like thee. More about Jesus would I learn. More of his holy will discern. I want to talk tonight about this one word, the increase. And five things. Number one, the qualities that ought to be, must increase. Number two, the possibility of an increase. And number three, the necessity of an increase. Number four, the means of the increase. And number five, the results of the increase. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but it'll just be taken at phrase by phrase, almost exactly phrase by phrase, right down through here in these verses. So number one, brethren, will you consider with me what qualities... Peter's saying, ought to be, must be increasing. He says here in verse 8, if these qualities, what qualities? Surely the ones mentioned in verse 5 and following. He says, in your faith, if your faith is pure, if your faith is real, sincere, genuine, Faith only in Christ. If you've got this like precious faith that he mentions up in verse 1, then you add to that moral excellence. That is virtue. That is strength. That is courage. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, uh, by faith, out of weakness, they were made strong, waxed valiant and fight and put to flight the armies of the aliens. And I read a biography, I, I'm looking for moral excellence. I'm looking for examples of courage and strength. Number three, he mentions knowledge. Know the book. If I, if I could do my Christian years over again, I would like to give more attention to knowing the book of God. I mean to know it like the back of my hand, to know what's something in every chapter. You've got to know the book. And uh, knowledge, think of it. You might do well, some of you young folks, to go around the camp and ask different ones, what, give me your top ten books to read. And just buy a hundred or two hundred of books. And know those, know those, read those, and read them well, and know what's in them. I've told my children... <laughs> Get Conrad's books read. And I know he'd agree, or, if he, or he wouldn't have written them. <laughs> Next, self-control. How to control our lips, how to control our lives, how to control our thoughts. These, we're talking about the qualities that must be increasing. The other day, a new convert, a fellow that had been uh, professed for years, was telling me that that uh, he was in the he went into the kitchen the other day to fix a peanut butter sandwich and fell into an internal tug of war. Why am I eating this peanut butter sandwich? Do I need it or is it just gluttony? This is the spirit of God at work, self-control. And next. Perseverance, not giving in, not quitting like children, but pressing on, standing like a soldier. William Carey said, I'm nothing but a plotter. Then he mentions godliness. That's more than just religion, right? 
It's, uh, it's having the touch of God upon your life. Peter says, seeing all these things that are going are to pass away, what sort of persons we, should we be in holy conduct and godliness? And then he mentions brotherly kindness. There's a family up there in Sedalia. The mother is, she's a mother in Israel. And she told her four boys when they were growing up, kindness goes a long way. And then love. We're going to go on with God. We're going to have to get out of ourselves and have a love for the souls of men. Now this list that he gives here, these qualities that he gives here, it's not a complete list, is it? I mean, for example, at the end of, his, of this second Peter, he mentions growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. In another place... It mentions the walk. I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, We gave you instruction how you ought to walk and to please God, and you actually are doing that. Now excel still more. It ought to be increasing. Right up here in verse 4, he talks about being a partaker of the divine nature, that is, being conformed to Christ. Victory over lust, and so on. Escaping the corruption that is in the world by lust. Oh, we're talking about the increase. Peter, what do you mean? I mean these qualities right here. They ought to be in you. They ought to be yours. They ought to be increasing. So, what qualities that must increase? Secondly, the possibility of an increase. We see it in the physical realm. I mean in math. You know, one increased by one is two. A carpenter comes home and at the end of the day and he says, well, we made some progress today. A bodybuilder, he wants to make some increase. And so in the spiritual realm, there is such a thing as a, an increase. Samuel, it says, he grew in favor with God and with men. The Lord Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. John the Baptist, it says, grew strong in spirit. Abraham did not grow weak in faith, but became strong in faith, giving glory to God. And uh, Paul exhorts Timothy, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, that your progress might be evident to all. Paul himself testifies in Philippians 3, nearing the end of his life, that he wants to apprehend that for which he's been apprehended. He says, forget the things that are behind, I'm reaching forward to the things that are before. He, he wasn't talking about his failures, forgetting his failures, he was talking about forgetting his attainments. He still wanted to go on and lay hold of that for which he'd been laid hold of. Paul prays for the Colossians that they might increase in the knowledge of God. And uh, the apostles prayed, Lord, increase our faith. The early church, it says they were going on in the fear of God and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and they continued uh, to increase. I'm talking about the possibility of an increase. I, I mean, brethren, we uh, do not have to be the same as we are next year. We can be different next year than we are right now. We can know God more next year than we know Him now. We can know His ways more next year than we know Him now. We don't have to dwell where doubts arise and fears dismay. We don't have to allow any iniquity to have dominion over us. Number three, the necessity of the increase. Talked about the qualities. Secondly, the possibility of an increase. Now number three, the necessity of an increase. He says here in verse 8, or verse 9, he who lacks 
these qualities. He is blind or short-sighted and is forgotten. In the physical realm, and it's, it's a must. I mean, the businessman knows that he must, that business must grow or it's going to fail. And the farmer, he knows that uh, the livestock, they've got to gain or he's going to be in trouble. He does everything that he can to improve that rate of gain. Keep the pens clean, keep the water clean, keep the grubs and the flies away. He's got to see an increase. The livestock farmer the same. <clears throat> everything he does, everything he can do to keep the plants from going into stress and and stopping growth. If they stop the growth, there's going to be trouble. They may never recover. Those those plants may never recover. I'm talking about the necessity of an increase. If a mother sees the baby quit is no longer growing, she knows. <laughs> There's something wrong, something bad wrong. She's alarmed. If the plane keep, quits progressing, it's going to come down. There's got to be an increase. And so in the spiritual realm, growth is a necessary element in a true profession. He says here, he, is for, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted and has forgotten purification. I don't know... <clears throat> That sounds pretty bad to me. It's either apostasy or it's a false profession. Blind, short-sighted, has forgotten that he's even for forgiven of his sins. One time I went to visit a friend up in Iowa, and uh, he took me out there uh, on the backside of his farmstead and showed me his buffalo herd. And uh, he was telling me how that one was ready for butchering, and he shot the thing and it went down. And he opened the gate and he went in there <clears throat> to drag it out and he fastened the chain on the leg of that buffalo and he happened to notice out of the corner of his eye a movement in the buffalo's eye. And he knew that thing isn't dead and he took off for the gate and got out just in time. I'm saying movement is a sign of life. If there's no movement, no increase, uh, you got death. It is a necessity. And if this does not mean apostasy, then it's talking about a false profession. Maybe it is a false profession. What, I mean, I say that for these reasons. He's talking here in verse 8 about a, the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The true knowledge in contrast to the false knowledge, a false profession. And in Second Peter, I mean in chapter 2, he's talking there about a false profession. He's not talking about apostasy. His burden is a, a true or a false profession. And uh, furthermore, this business of stumbling and uh, not entering the kingdom, that sounds like a false profession. In the parable, <clears throat> Derry, could you please go get me some water? In the parable of the pounds or the talents, that one fella that <clears throat> went to hell, why did he go? Because he only had one? No, because he did not make an increase. I'm talking about the necessity of an increase in the spiritual life. In Amos chapter 6, it says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. In Zephaniah 1.12, it says, God will come and he will search Jerusalem with candles and he will punish those who are stagnant in spirit. Stagnant in spirit. No progress, no increase, no change. Dead like a lagoon. I'm talking about the necessity of an increase. No fruit? That's a mark of a false professor. It says in Luke uh, chapter 8, The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and lust for other things, and they bring forth no fruit to maturity.
I guess this is what it's for. <laughs> We don't want to we don't want to have any used to we don't want to be in a used to used to condition. I used to enjoy reading the Bible. I used to enjoy prayer. I used to enjoy fellowship. I used to have things to share. I used to enjoy sharing the gospel with the lost. We don't ever want to be in a used to condition. The psalmist says, I used to go along with the throng to the place of God. The writer to the Hebrews says, when for the time you ought to be teachers. You don't want to be uh, in a place, uh, you don't want to be in a place where you say, I, I'm not where I ought to be. Uh, about 25 years ago, I stood here in this pulpit and brought a sermon uh, entitled to be setting sin and somehow that got posted online and uh, I listened to part of it and I tell you brethren it scared me I mean I had to ask am I do I still feel it how is my heart do I still feel it that way the way I preached that sermon then we don't want to we don't want to be in a used to condition you see we're talking here not about existing holiness but we're talking about, about progressive holiness now false teachers would not agree with this i mean not only do they, they deny the necessity of an increase in holiness they deny the existence uh, of holiness as being necessary for a true profession. He's, he, Peter says, if these qualities are yours, that is, in existence, and increasing. Some even deny that a profession is necessary. I read uh, a quote from a fellow over there in Atlanta with a worldwide ministry his book entitled Eternal Security probably should be, would be better titled False Security. He said that you, a believer, can abandon his profession and yet retain his salvation. You don't even need a profession. The, the politicians, you know, we tend to blame the politicians. They are not the problem in the land. It's the preachers, yes. crooked preachers. Yes. <clears throat> Someone gave me the, uh, the story of Bob Pierce. Uh, it was a biography written by his daughter in a kindly way. And Bob Pierce, <clears throat> in the early 1900s, preached uh, to thousands. Probably the reason we didn't hear too much about him is because it was not over here in the United States. It was over in foreign lands. He would preach to thousands. He would see 100, 200, 500 people walk the aisle. He went on to found a <clears throat> World Vision, which is probably the biggest, yet <clears throat> the biggest Christian relief agency in the world. So they go through about $24 million every year, or $22 million, I read, and have like 24,000 people on their staff. And then he went on also to found Samaritan's Purse. <clears throat> the only problem of it was, uh, I mean, a big ministry, but... The man had a reputation for anger. <clears throat> it says, he, it says, do not be deceived. Those who have outbursts of anger will not inherit the kingdom, Galatians 5. Not only that, but he didn't provide for his own. He didn't provide for his own family, stability, and love. Now we know that that man was not an infidel. 
we know that that man was worse than an infidel. First Peter chapter 5 says. But <clears throat> this man, you see, was big on his work, but not big on his walk. Like one man said, we must never let the business of the king be more important than the king himself. And that's why so many who are first will be last. That's why many will say to the Lord in that day, didn't we have a big ministry? And then I'll say to them, no intimacy. I'm talking yet about the necessity of the increase. I, the true Christian, for him there will be an increase. It's a certainty for everyone who is born again. Sure, there's going to be ups and downs, but nevertheless, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines more and more under the perfect day. Why can that be? How can that be? Because in eternity past, God predetermined that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. And then in time, we've been born again by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God works in us. The Spirit of God changes us from glory to glory. In the physical realm, growth stops. Progress stops. I remember when I was a little boy, I asked my father, what, when does a person become the strongest? And he said, oh, I suppose when he's about 25. And after that, it goes downhill. But it's not that way in the spiritual realm, right? I mean, we have been imparted divine life, and you think of the power of the life of God in the soul of a man. It's a wonder we don't explode like an overpowered tractor at a tractor pull. Think of a, a tree planted beside, a tree growing beside a sidewalk. That, because there's life there, it can break up the concrete sidewalk. We have the Spirit of God in our heart, changing us from glory to glory. We've been given a new heart. We've been, we put on the new man, which it says is being renewed day by day. In Psalm 84, how blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. They go from strength to strength. In Mark 4, 8, it says, The seed that is sown on the good soil, it grew up and increased and yielded a crop. Increased and yielded a crop, 30, 60, and 100 folds. The Lord causes the increase. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says, I Now may the Lord cause you to increase and abound. The Lord causes this increase. He works in us to will and do of his good pleasure. In John 6, it says, They'll all be taught of God, and it says uh, that God teaches us to love one another. And so we make an increase. God sees to it that we don't go stagnant. And that all the way to the end. He who began a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Christ. Psalm 92, it says, they, Even in old age they will still yield fruit and be full of sap and very green. <clears throat> Number four, what are the means of an increase? The thing that Peter mentions right here is what? Diligence. In verse 5, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence. And then in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Diligence is involved in seeing these qualities increase. Leonard Ravenhill said, we are, we are as holy as we want to be. I know that's not the whole truth, but it is true. So much of our lack of progress is just because we're too sloppy and we're too casual and uh, not sacrificial enough. And so we 
pamper and pet and play around and uh, don't make enough effort at this matter of the increase. You know, where there's no pain, there's no gain. It's true in sports, and it's true for the Christian athlete, too. And Paul tells Timothy, take pains with these things, and uh, that your progress may be evident to all. Especially keeping the heart. Keeping the heart clean. It says in Job, he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Diligence. Secondly, the word of God. Peter says in verse 4 that he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. In his first epistle, like newborn babes long for the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. The Word of God. Paul sent Timothy to the Thessalonians to give them some teaching to complete what is lacking in their faith. Haven't you read a book that just changed your life? I mean, it renewed your mind. You were never the same again. The Word of God is very instrumental in seeing an increase. Also prayer. The disciples, they said, Lord, increase our faith. That, that, they were praying for an increase. Paul prayed for the Colossians. I pray for you that you may increase in the knowledge of God. You want to know what you can pray for one another? You can pray for this right here. Pray for their increase. Paul prayed for the Thessalonians that they might increase in faith and love. Was it answered? You turn over to the second Thessalonians and he says, I see that your faith is increasing and your love is abounding. Another thing that will help us in the increase is fellowship. And all the more as we see the day approaching, stimulating one another to love and good deeds. Fellowship. I didn't say socializing, but fellowship. Another thing is trials. You've got to prune the blueberries if you're going to see an increased yield. And so the Lord chastens us that we might be partakers of His holiness. I remember one time when I was working for a man, a godly man up in northeast Iowa, and uh, his old father was riding with me, and, and he was telling me about his son, how that when uh, this son, my employer, lost his oldest son, lost their firstborn. And old Carl said, when Vader lost his oldest son, he drowned in the farm pond, he said, Vader was never the same again. And God touched Jacob. He was not the same after that. It plants our feet on higher ground. In conclusion, what are the results of an increase? It says here in verse 8, If these qualities are yours in increasing, they will render you, they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful and so on. They will render you. I remember back on the farm, uh, whenever an animal died, we'd call the rendering truck. I looked up this word in the Greek, it means to put down. So they'd call the rendering truck, they'd take that dead animal away and put him down. This will put you down, it will establish, strengthen, and settle you in these ways. He, spe he speaks of usefulness. Usefulness. See, I believe it's inherent in everybody, a desire to be useful to God. If these qualities are in you and increasing, they will make you useful. Some do not refine their lives and make the progress, and they are, re they are relatively useless in the kingdom of God. 
And if they would but deal with this and that, they could be useful. Secondly, he mentions fruitfulness. Growth makes for fruitfulness. I don't know where I first heard it. But have you heard this saying? I think there's, it's loaded with wisdom. Do not seek a ministry, but rather wait for the fruit that will naturally appear as a result of a disciplined life. Don't seek a ministry. You don't have to go off to Bible school or seminary and seek a ministry. Why do it? Why not believe God right here? And discipline your life. Make sure these qualities are in you and increasing and God will put your, fill your hand with work, with fruit. Hudson Taylor, he's got those two books, two biographies. The first one is The Growth of a Soul and second, The Growth of a Ministry, The Growth of a Work. Follow me and I will make you fishers. I'll make you. If you would follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. So the results of the increase, usefulness and fruitfulness. Also, in verse 10, is another result of the increase. And that is assurance of salvation. In the New American, it uses the word certain. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. And in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom will it be abundantly supplied to you. So, <clears throat> assurance of salvation. Yes, there are other grounds for assurance, like taking God at his word by faith and the witness of the Spirit. But here we're talking about the walk. In John, 1 John it says, if you love in not in word and tongue, but in deed and truth, you will uh, know that you're of the truth and will assure your heart before him. There is assurance of salvation that comes to a holy life, a progressively, a progressing holy life. How do I know that my calling is not just some false uh, experience? How do I know, taking it back yet further, how do I know that my election of God is not just some imagination, some presumption in my mind? How do I know it? Here he tells you can know that your calling and election is sure. You can be sure about it. The fruit proves the root. You can know that you're one of the elect of God and that's your supreme joy and know that your name is written in heaven and that is your supreme joy and a rock to walk on to know that your relationship with God is older than the hills. And he says, you'll never stumble and in this way an entrance into the eternal kingdom will be supplied to you, an entrance into the kingdom. And you get there to those gates of pearl. It'll be a wide gate. You start out in the narrow gate. At the end, it'll be a wide gate. Abundantly supplied to you into the eternal kingdom. Kingdoms all around, empires, nations are toppling. But here we are inheriting an eternal kingdom. If these qualities are in you and increasing, there's the results. Be all the more diligent. Amen.